Welcome to the VPR Vermont PBS debate series. It's an opportunity to hear from the candidates running for statewide office. I'm Bob Kinzel of Vermont Public Radio, and today we have the five candidates who are seeking the Republican nomination for Lieutenant Governor. We'd all like to be in the same studio for this program, but that's not possible during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're gonna do the best we can with our Zoom technology. And with us today in alphabetical order, Dana Coulson, who is from Sharon. He has degrees in mechanical engineering and business management from Vermont Technical College. He loves to hunt and fish. And five years ago, he started his own business, North Country Welding Supply. Also with us, Meg Hansen, who lives in Manchester. As an Indian American, she believes she's the first woman of color to run for Lieutenant Governor as a Republican. She has the British equivalent of a US medical degree and she owns her own business. Also with us, Jim Hogue of Callis. He's an actor who runs a small farm. He's worked to prohibit electronic voting in Vermont and he writes for Vermont Independent on issues of banking and Vermont history. Scott Milne is here. He lives in Pomfret. He's a small business person, owns and operates Milne Travel. They have three locations in Vermont and employees in 10 states. He ran for governor in 2014 and lost a very close race with incumbent Peter Shumlin. He also ran for the US Senate in 2016 and lost to incumbent Patrick Leahy. And finally with us, Dwayne Tucker of Barrie. He's a contractor and civil engineer. He also graduated from Vermont Technical College and he ran unsuccessfully for the Vermont Senate in Washington County in 2018. So here's our format for today's debate. In this first section, I'll ask the candidates a similar question and they have 45 seconds to respond. In the second section, the candidates will have an opportunity to ask each other questions, very brief questions, followed by a 45 second response. In the third section, we'll have questions from our listeners. Again, the responses will be limited to 45 seconds. And when we have time, we'll throw in a lightning round of questions where the responses are less than five seconds. I'm asking all the candidates to adhere to our time limits so we can cover as many topics as possible. So let's start off with the first question. Vermont is facing a demographic crisis as the population grows older over the next 10 years. The number of people over 65 in the state will increase by 2030 by 50%. And this is gonna have a huge impact on all aspects of life in the state. So please briefly tell us two or three initiatives that you would support to help reverse this trend and bring more younger families to Vermont. Dana Colson, you wanna start us off? Sure. Um, we need to stop people from fleeing the state uh, due to high taxes and overregulation, uh, first and foremost. Uh, Act 250 is an area where I'd focus on overregulation and exempt small projects from Act 250. Uh, taxes, uh, you know, we got to make some cuts, uh, and that starts. Uh, First, uh, I put out a proposal to uh, have the agency heads uh, make their own cuts. And the uh, governor apparently liked that idea and made a similar proposal and sent it to the legislature. They kicked the can down the road. Very good. Meg Hansen, what are your thoughts on this subject? Hi, Bob. Thank you for um, inviting me, and I'm uh, glad to be with everybody on this a very important debate. Our demographic crisis is the number one reason that um, middle-class families, young professionals, uh, working professionals, and even our seniors are abandoning uh, Vermont. So our structurally weak economy, the mountains of red tape and bureaucracy and draconian regulations are the reason why we don't have upwardly mobile careers. And that is the reason why um, you know, we are not able to attract businesses or young people. So uh, I would say <laughs> focusing on increasing economic freedom and cutting government spending would be the best way forward. Thank you, Meg. Jim Hogue, what are your thoughts? 
are you trying to attract a general base or are you looking for technically skilled people, farmers or what? Um, yes, of course, the high taxes are something driving people out of the state and they're a problem for people coming in. Uh, one of my big solutions, I'm part of a company that grows soil and this could revolutionize the quality of the soil in Vermont. It could in, encourage a lot of farmers to come into the state. It works with flood mitigation and it works with, uh, it helps water quality and essentially it is a grazing method. So I believe that the farming sector is a place authentically attractive to young people and um, along with any other sector that needs people to, to, to help build the state. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Mellon, what are your thoughts on this subject? Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, Bob, thank you very much. Uh, public broadcasting, uh, thanks for hosting this debate. Uh, clearly, we had a demographic problem uh, six months ago. We have a demographic problem today. We've got a, a much worse problem, which is uh, getting our economy out of this post-COVID crisis. Uh, I'm drawn into this race. Obviously, I've got a business and families that are dependent upon my business. I'm on the front lines of seeing what COVID's doing, first of all, to our medical situation. Soon we're going to see uh, just the uh, demise of our economy. We need people with business experience, uh, with an outlook uh, and a history of being able to create jobs to help us get out of this. There's a little bit of a chicken or an egg. Are the young people going to come first and then the jobs? Are the jobs going to come then the young people? I'm focused on both, but I'll be very good and focused as lieutenant governor on getting jobs, good companies to stay in Vermont and come to Vermont. Thank you, Scott. Dwayne Tucker, your thoughts about the demographic crisis. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity for me to, uh, to be here. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a clear, clear issue. Um, Vermont has a demographic crisis. Um, for, first, I think, first and foremost, we need to address the uh, taxation. Um, secondly, we need to continue uh, to, to pursue um, the, the options and the possibilities to provide our, our younger generations uh, a quality education and we also need to provide them with an the opportunity to uh, to succeed here in Vermont with uh, with with a successful career path um, currently we're not providing that and that's why um, we're, we're in this crisis as as far as a uh, you know demographics show um, that the age of retirement and the younger generation not staying here well, that concludes our first question question number two it seems like the Vermont Republican Party is divided into two wings. Those who support President Trump and feel like he's doing a good job. The GOP state party organization feels this way. And then there's another group that includes Governor Phil Scott who don't support the president and say they won't even vote for him. So where do you stand on this ideological spectrum and what, what do you think is the best approach for Vermont? Meg Hansen? Uh, thank you, Bob. I 100% support uh, President Trump, and I'll tell you why. The reason is because before COVID, the Trump administration was uh, responsible for record low unemployment rates for women and minority groups, African Americans and Hispanic populations. I think that uh, prioritizing and restoring the value and importance of work in our society by increasing access to different kinds of labor. So not necessarily a four year degree at a liberal arts college, but also secondary and post secondary training in the in the trades and specialized skills. These things are very important to grow our economy. And the, I think the best approach would be to look at policies and understand what a particular administration is doing. So um, any administration that increases um, access to work and improves our um, quality of life should have our 100% support. Jim Hogue, what are th your thoughts on this subject? I uh, did not support uh, Trump when he ran before and I am looking for some interesting candidates to appear someone along the lines of a Ron Paul uh, in any event I have been amused and very much impressed at the way Trump survived the attacks from the media from the DNC the fake the, the Russia hoax the 
uh, Mueller hoax, and he came out of those with his head above water, and I'm very impressed. And also his move to try to encourage doctors, hospitals, and patients to uh, look into other methods of of solving the Corona uh, the COVID nineteen problem. Thank you, Scott Mellon. What are your thoughts? Uh, thanks for the question, Bob. Uh, I wish that President Trump had kept his promise, frankly, to act more presidential. Uh, I also look at Vice President Biden and really don't see him as being up for the job. If I look around Vermont or look around for somebody who would be an inspiring president, has the uh, right uh, temperament and uh, intellect, I think of our former governor, Jim Douglas, uh, not to mention it would be a great first lady if it uh, works out. Uh, I'll be writing in Jim Douglas's name for president uh, in uh, November. Thank you, Scott. Dwayne Tucker? Um, I think that's a fantastic question. You know, uh, the past several administrations, um, the presidential administrations has had kind of run um, the United States of America as if it was a business up for liquidation. Uh, I, I think it speaks great volumes about uh, the Trump administration um, and his successes and, and who he actually cares for, the working class American. And uh, to boot, he, he is, uh, he's a successful businessman. Um, I, I think he truly does have, have uh, the American citizen in, in mind, and he, he is a, a fighter for their rights. Um, from an economic standpoint, health care, um, I, I truly believe he's got our, our primary interests at heart. Thank you, Dwayne. Dana? I support the president, uh, first and foremost, because of the economy. I think he's good for the economy. Uh, you know, I kind of cringe at some of his tweets, but, um, you know, you take what you get. And I think um, he will do a good job in 2020 and beyond. And I definitely uh, support many of his policies. Uh, I also like Jim Douglas as well. So uh, I think he's a good man. And uh, I, would, I would love to see him uh, go down to Washington as well. Thank you, Dana. It's time now we're gonna slip into our lightning round. Now these are five second answers. We thought we'd get a couple of questions in. Number one, if there are circumstances where the state budget cannot be balanced without enacting some significant cuts in human service programs, would you consider raising some taxes in the short term? Jim Hogue? Uh, no, I would not. I'm for a state bank or an infrastructure bank. Scott Mill. Uh, I'm not in favor of uh, raising taxes. We uh, got ourselves into this hole by spending, uh, and I think we need to get out of it by uh, frugal Vermont traditional behavior. Dwayne Tucker? Absolutely not raise taxes. I would I would be much rather cut cut government staffing. Dana Colson. No raising taxes. Um, I had already put a proposal out to make cuts and I stand by that. Uh, I think it can be done through attrition and uh, maybe do some delayed equipment purchases and other methods similar to that. Meg Hansen? Absolutely not. And we don't even need to do it because um, Caledonian Record, for example, put out a very good editorial that lists a whole bunch of services that we can cut without, or staffing rather, we can cut without hurting public services to Vermont. And I'd add uh, our billion dollar nonprofit sector, which acts as a shadow government and the all peer model, which is another billion dollar boondoggle, are great places to cut. So we don't need to raise any taxes. Let's go to another lightning round question. As you all know, the legislature is considering a plan to have the state tax and regulate the sale of marijuana, much like the current system with alcohol. Do you support this approach, Dwayne Tucker? Um, what, once again, I, I, think that, I think the state has, has put the cart before the horse and I think before they can regulate it from a, a, a profit or a taxation standpoint, um, we need to legalize it and from a law enforcement standpoint. Um, so, so those are my thoughts on, on that. Dana Colson? I think first we need to have a roadside test method where we prevent uh, impaired drivers 
first and foremost. So if you can satisfy the law enforcement concern first, then I have no issue with it. Meg Hansen. No, and I think that we shouldn't be comparing with alcohol, but with the way Vermont legislates e-cigarettes. Um, if um, vaping has been uh, has a 92% tax and has been almost banned prior to COVID because of the negative public health consequences and the risk of increased youth use, then we need to apply the same logic to uh, legalizing marijuana as well. And then by that measure, it would be prohibitory. Jim Hogue. Uh, it's not like alcohol. Uh, it should be legalized and the government should stay out of it. There are so many wonderful products connected to it. Scott Milne. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, we've made a lot of uh, progress in decriminalizing marijuana and avoiding, uh, you know, people's lives being ruined or impacted because of it. But we still have a lot of work to do before we're ready to have a tax and regulate system. First of all, the uh, federal government needs to get its act together and uh, enable marijuana businesses to not also be money launderers. So I think we really need to pressure our federal delegation to get the banking system and interstate commerce opened up so that states that do decide they want to, I think it's a state's rights issue, states should be able to legalize and regulate and all this, but the federal government really needs to lead and get its act together before Vermont jumps into it. Remember now in our lightning round, we're really trying to go for five seconds in the future as we look at the <laughs> lightning round questions. Well, this concludes the first segment of our program. When we come back, the candidates will have an opportunity to ask each other questions. This is the VPR Vermont PBS Republican Lieutenant Governor's debate. For 16 consecutive years, PBS has been voted the most trusted American institution. You come to us for NewsHour, Washington Week, and BBC America. And you watch Vermont This Week for the top stories in our state. Here at Vermont PBS, you will always find a dependable forum for civil dialogue. Your donation right now ensures that we keep independent news coverage on the air and online. Thank you for your investment in Vermont PBS. This is the VPR Vermont PBS Republican Lieutenant Governor's debate. We have five candidates seeking this nomination. Dana Coulson, Meg Hansen, Jim Hogue, Scott Milne, and Dwayne Tucker. It's time now for the candidates to have the opportunity to ask each other questions, and your question can be directed at any of the other candidates. <clears throat> the question should be very brief. The answers are limited to 45 seconds. Meg Hansen, start us off. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to ask my first question to Scott. Scott, every citizen should be able to vote, but our voter lists have not been cleaned in years. Proof. Here are two people live at my address and I got three cards to request an early ballot. You've said that opposing mass mail-in voting is equal to voter suppression and quote, those who oppose it deserve to lose elections. Republicans are concerned about protecting election integrity. How can you represent us when you don't even understand our legitimate concerns? The situation in Vermont right now is we have a very good system. We have one of the most uh, easy to use uh, absentee ballot systems in the country. I think that uh, that system works well. Uh, I'm worried that we're rushing into this new experiment run by the Secretary of State, th pushed through a partisan legislature without the governor being able to overlook it and it's gonna to lead to a lot of problems and undermine confidence in voting. Uh, but we need to work towards a system that enables people to securely vote and to make it easier for people to vote. Dwayne Tucker, who do you have a question for? Mr. Milne, I think you're gonna be in the hot seat this morning. <laughs> um, you're, you're, you're a fairly well-known member of the, uh, the community in Vermont, uh, Washington County and throughout Vermont. Um, you're, you're known as a, a pretty successful businessman. Um, if you were elected governor, uh, lieutenant governor rather, um, what, what are three primary issues um, you feel are priorities in addressing and uh, how do you propose dealing with them? 
Yeah, thanks for the question, Dwayne. Uh, first of all, I, I think, uh, you know, and, and we're all, uh, I believe we're all old enough to remember just how uh, important it is with uh, Howard Dean and uh, Governor Snelling uh, just uh, 30 years ago, I believe. Uh, number one, uh, it's important to have somebody who's ready to step up. God, God forbid something happens to our governor. So uh, that's something I believe I've demonstrated over the last five or six years, both in my personal life and my business and my political endeavors that I'm uh, at least as good as anybody on the on the uh, uh, stage today for that. Secondly, uh, we need to uh, focus on rebuilding our economy after this COVID uh, health crisis is over. Uh, I will be focused on that all the time. And I think, uh, you know, not to be cute, uh, Mr. Tucker, but you could do jobs, jobs, jobs are the three things that are connected to that. I think that's what I'll be focused on as Lieutenant Governor. Jim Hogue, who do you have a question for? Um, I have a question for everybody, but I don't know how to pick someone. If I have to, I'll, I'll pick Meg. Uh, but one correction about who I am, I did write the bill that prohibited electronic voting in Vermont when Jim Condos was senator. And uh, it is now Vermont statute. So on the voting issue, um, what, what are your thoughts given the present climate? I'm sorry, Jim, the question, the question is? Uh, the question is, given the present climate in the, in the country with uh, mail-in voting, which could be a step toward fraudulent, uh, a fraudulent election, and other new methods of fraud that keep catching up to, to us in Vermont. And this, do you, have you been looking into that? And uh, what are your thoughts on it? Thank you, Jim. So this is a very, very important issue. Ensuring and protecting our election integrity is absolutely vital to protecting our constitutional republic. And as I just showed, um, and this is happening everywhere, the voter rolls or voter lists have not been cleaned or updated for years. So it has many, many Vermonters who um, are no longer with us or who moved away. Um, and we don't have a signature verification. We don't have um, added measures to ensure that uh, living citizens who live in Vermont are voting. So I think that's very, very important for us to keep in mind. And I really hope that Jim, got, Jim Condos and others uh, put extra measures to ensure and protect election integrity. That is 100% vital um, in, August, in August and in November. Thank you, Meg. Scott Milne, who gets your question? question. Uh, first of all, Mr. Colson, uh, I stopped at the uh, trading post for a coffee on my way north uh, this morning and w Wally says hello. We had a good conversation about you. You got a great reputation uh, locally for being a good guy. I know you've had some uh, turmoil, tragedy in your family and it's one of your primary motivations for being into this race. Uh, I was in a 4th of July parade with about 18 supporters in uh, 2014, I looked around and saw that a third of the people who I knew in that parade either had drug problems or family members with drug problems. I know that's something you know a lot about. What can you do as Lieutenant Governor and uh, for those of us uh, that are here, what can we do to help get Vermont through this opiate crisis and towards a uh, brighter future? Well, you're correct. It's a major problem here in Vermont. I suspect that many more uh, kids have died due to opioids than coronavirus and we need to attack that problem with three aspects uh, first education second treatment and third enforcement uh, lead program is something advocated by the orange county sheriff's department uh, very interactive and role playing with the kids uh, second uh, we don't have a secure rehab facility in the state uh, and third, on um, the enforcement aspect, uh, we really need to support our law enforcement and um, the punishment should, uh, we shouldn't do catch and release. It only works for fishing. Thank you, Dana. And Dana, you have a question for one of the candidates. Yes, my first question, uh, given the recent uh, news article on Molly Gray, I did a little research and found some interesting information. So I'd like to ask Meg, have you uh, lived in any other state in the last four years? 
Thank you for the question, Dana. Um, I moved to the Upper Valley uh, 10 years ago. Windsor was my home. And I've been a full-time resident of Vermont over the last 10 years. Um, I've paid my taxes. This is uh, where I have my license. Um, no, my home has been Vermont for the last 10 years. Thank you, Meg. Time now for our second round of questions from the candidates. Scott Milne, start us off. Who gets your second question? Washington County Senator. Uh, obviously, I hope you're uh, much more successful in your Washington County Senate race. Uh, you and I both have uh, Central Vermont roots. Uh, if you are successful uh, as a Senator from Washington County representing Central Vermont, what will be your priorities? Uh, how will you get those priorities achieved? And as Lieutenant Governor, if I'm fortunate enough to serve Vermont, what can I do to help you? Well, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, my heart is, is really focused on the Washington County Senate seat. Um, I, I, believe, I believe that Vermont needs to address the industry standpoint uh, in central Vermont. And I, I feel that um, I, can, I can selectively focus on my town and my county uh, and represent it better from a, from a farming and agricultural standpoint, addressing the opiate epidemic. Um, like you had stated earlier, there are so many people that are affected by opiate, the, the opiate crisis in Vermont. Um, and, and, and we're failing from a county standpoint to provide treatment facilities for these individuals. Um, and, and we're not, we're also not allowing, um, an opportunity for people to seek, um, standard sturdy employment. Um, so, so as you know, um, I have a super hard work ethic. I, I stand up for the people in my town, in, in my county. Um, I'm very supportive um, in pushing things in the right direction. Um, so so I, I think strength, uh, unity, um, bridging the gap between the, the, the party divide is, is an absolute necessity to show that um, it's, it's not about party lines. Wayne, we're going to have to end it right politics. here. Unfortunately, you were out of time. I uh, hope everybody can stick to our time limits. That would be very helpful. Dana Colson, who gets your second question? Well, my second question would be for Scott. Uh, you know, in your announcement, you uh, be pretty good friends with Phil Scott, and I was wondering if you supported his policy of giving out-of-staters $10,000 to move here. Uh, uh, very good question, Dana. Uh, interestingly, uh, although Phil let that bill go through, that was a uh, Democratic-led uh, House of Representatives uh, bill and proposal. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't disagree with Bill with uh, Phil letting it go through. I think uh, we've got a demographic crisis. We need to be uh, bold and uh, I believe mistakes in, in my personal life and in, with business, I think mistakes of action are better than mistakes of inaction. I don't think it's something that we want to renew and keep doing, but I, I think it was worth a try. Thank you for the question. Jim Hogue, who gets your second question? All right, I'd like to ask the elephant in the room question that hasn't been uh, brought up yet. And I'm gonna go, go after Meg again on this one, which is the, the COVID question worldwide is, is a huge one. The, the virus hasn't even been isolated yet. So there can't be a valid test, there can't be a valid vaccine, and South Dakota is handling it very well. So when are, is, is this discussion gonna be opened up to how to deal with the present protocols and are they legitimate and legal? Thank you, Jim. Yes, uh, COVID, is a global pandemic and we're all dealing with it. But the good thing though, is that now we have more information about it. And what we know is that the fatality rate for those who are under the age of 70 is 0.04%. And for children or those under the age of 18, it's practically zero. Um, we know that it um, affects the elderly, especially those about 80 and those with pre-existing conditions. So we don't need to have a one-size-fits-all approach moving forward. I think that would be very unwise. It would, it would be much better for us to um, 
focus our resources on helping at-risk populations and open up the economy, of course, with uh, social distancing and safe safety guidelines, uh, because, you know, having an extended economic shutdown has public health consequences as well. Um, and of course, economic consequences and economic devastation where right now we have one in four Vermonters without a job. So yes, not a one size fits approach moving forward, focusing on at risk populations. Thank you, Meg. Dwayne Tucker, a second question. Dana, uh, this question is for you. As, as, a, as a businessman um, and, and a, a, a fairly prominent member of your community, you're, you're, you're well known in your community. Um, what, what business aspects can you bring to, to the table um, as Lieutenant Governor and, and what, what would your primary focuses be on from, from an economic standpoint? Thank you for the question. Uh, I had wrote an article for True North Reports about reviving our rural economy that focuses on farms for first and foremost. Uh, also helping our logging industry. Um, millennials don't know that you know, 100 years ago, most of our hills were bare pasture, about 10% wooded. Now they're just the opposite, about 90% wooded. Uh, we have an abundance of wood and uh, helping the farmers by reducing their taxes. Uh, and you know, I have a background in international business as well as being a small business owner. Um, we're doing business for over 20 years. So I think that'll be a very useful resource uh, as Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Meg Hansen, your second question for one of the other candidates. Thank you, Bob. My question is for Scott. Um, Scott, you're saying that um, the reason you entered the race and the reason why you'd be good for this position is because of, of your skill set as a in terms of the economy and recovering it. But it's really important for Vermonters and especially right of center Vermonters who are going to be voting in the primary to understand the philosophies that drive um, these particular uh, policies that you might put forward. You've supported Bernie Sanders, whose economic views and policies are the polar opposite, the antithesis of um, anybody who would be voting in the Republican primary. So why should Republican voters trust you to put forward policies um, when the philosophy itself is at such odds? Uh, thanks very much for the question, Meg. Um, my basic philosophy is the same as it's been for uh, I think my whole life, and I think it's very similar to my parents and my grandparents and uh, a lot of Vermonters, frankly, born out of the Aiken Gibson wing of the Vermont Republican Party. The more locally decisions can be made, the better the decisions are. We need to be working with facts and doing what's practical, not be pushing a political agenda uh, down Vermonters' throats. And uh, regarding uh, Senator Sanders, I have supported some things he's done. I mean, along with uh, President Trump, very supportive. I think they have the same uh, strategy and philosophy on trade. We've had some bad trade deals and President Trump and Sanders are on the same page with that. Uh, so uh, thanks for pointing that out. Thank you, Scott. This concludes the second segment of our debate. When we come back, we've got some more questions for the candidates and some more lightning rounds. This is the VPR Vermont PBS Republican Lieutenant Governor's debate. you have a lot of choices when it comes to television and streaming, but you know that Vermont PBS is different. Nowhere else will you find the local storytelling you find here. Nowhere else can you watch Mr. Chris and Friends, our Emmy-nominated children's show. Join us and share America's most trusted institution for 16 consecutive years. If you watch Vermont PBS, then please support us by donating right now. This is the VPR Vermont PBS Republican Lieutenant Governor's debate. We have five candidates with us seeking this nomination. 
Dana Coulson, Meg Hansen, Jim Hogue, Scott Milne, and Dwayne Tucker. And now it's time for some additional questions for the candidates that we've gotten from our listeners. We got this question from several folks. Most Democrats at the State House are strongly in favor of a paid family and medical leave bill and a plan to raise the state minimum wage to $15 an hour. Would you support these bills? Remember now, we've got 45 seconds for our answers. Jim Hogue, what are your thoughts? I uh, only heard the second one, uh, raising the minimum wage. Uh, we have to go back to the roots of the problem. We need a state bank. We need an infrastructure bank. I've been in the trenches at the State House for many years on that issue. Uh, we had a great victory with, um, with the legislature, but it was, I will say mysteriously, though I know how, that that debate was cut off. So um, my answer to the uh, minimum wage question is that the minimum wage is like the, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. And we need to look much more deeply into the sovereignty of Vermont and forming a state bank. Thank you, Jim. Scott Milne, your answer on two questions, both raising the minimum wage and also paid family leave. Sure. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, if money grew on trees, we could do a lot of things. Obviously, it doesn't. We've got a big pension problem. Uh, we've got a $300 million deficit next year. So we've got to limit uh, what we're spending money on. I would encourage folks, if you do a Google, I believe, Scott Milne, Fight, Fight, Fight 415. I wrote an op-ed opposing a uh, $15 minimum wage a couple of years ago. I think that should be driven by market. Also think uh, paid family leave. Uh, we have paid family leave essentially in our company. And I, I know a lot of Vermont employers do that. I think number one problem we have as a Vermont business uh, prior to COVID, I think it's gonna change a little bit is attracting talent. Uh, we should let the market uh, determine how to do that. And uh, most uh, employers that can afford to do that are doing that without the government telling them to do it. Thank you, Scott. Dwayne Tucker. <clears throat> I, I, I'm in full support of, of paid family leave and I think everybody should be entitled and, and have access to that to that benefit if, if you are working you know full time 40 hours a week and, and have a steady job uh, however in regards to the uh, minimum wage increase I, I do not believe and I throw I, I think it throws a, a, a monkey wrench in Vermont uh, from an economic standpoint um, you you are going to have people that are underqualified um, making a wage of people who are in the blue collar working force um, who have worked on heavy equipment their entire life or, or driven heavy equipment or, or um, truck drivers, and, and they're going to be making almost the same wage. Um, so, no, I, I'm not in favor of a minimum wage increase. Thank you, Dwayne. Dana Coulson? Well, I agree that uh, if money grew on trees, we could do all kinds of family leave and other benefits, but it doesn't. So I would let the markets determine that. Um, but I would certainly encourage employers who have the ability to do so. Uh, as far as the minimum wage, what is the point of increasing a worker's minimum wage if you're gonna raise their taxes by the same amount or more? Uh, so I would first and foremost cut their taxes so they get more net pay. Um, so that would be my approach. Thank you, Dana. Meg Hansen. Thank you. So if the goal of these uh, legislative proposals is to grow the economy um, and attract young people or families, then we should deregulate the economy and do comprehensive tax reform. That's how we get a uh, wage growth because we've, we've seen that in you know, increasing the minimum wage has not led to wage growth, which is a, it's a problem. And, um, you know, last year we were the second worst place to start a business. We ranked 43rd in terms of uh, economic freedom, whereas we're always competing with New Hampshire, which by the same study ranks number one when it comes to economic freedom. So, um, no, I wouldn't support that, but I would support deregulating and comprehensive tax reform to diversify and open up the economy and foster growth and development. Let's see if we can get one more question in and maybe bring our answers down to about 30 seconds since we're running out of time. You know, it seems like the COVID-19 pandemic has overshadowed many key issues for the past few months. And one of those issues is climate change. Would you support the imposition of a carbon tax to help discourage the use of fossil fuels and to help provide new money for home weatherization and energy efficiency projects? 
And if not, what would you do? Scott Mill? Oh, thanks, Bob. Obviously, uh, climate change is real and uh, humans uh, play a role in it. Uh, I'm not in favor of the uh, legislation that's come out of the uh, Vermont legislature this year. I think it disadvantages Vermonters, Vermont taxpayers. It's going to make it harder to attract young people to Vermont. It's a global problem. We should be working on national solutions. Uh, Vermont should not be a leader in regulation. Vermont should be a leader in using its brand to attract innovative companies that want to come up with solutions to solve the problem. As Lieutenant Governor, I'll be focused on bringing businesses like that to Vermont and working with the climate change advocates to actually get something tangible done. Thank you. Dwayne Tucker. Well, first of all, um, I wouldn't support any any sort of, of carbon tax only because people in Vermont are, are ha, have reduced their carbon footprint as much as humanly possible. As far as the Global Warming Solutions Act, um, we, we have our, our our country leaders and our state leaders are pushing an agenda that that is not necessarily needed here in Vermont. Uh, for example, if you go to if you go to California, you look on the 405. Any 10 mile stretch of the 405 has has uh, more interstate traffic than both northbounds and southbound um, traffic on 89 and 91. Um, it's an agenda that should not be pushed here, and and we need to we need to lead by example for what's good in Vermont. Thank you. Dana Colson? I would not support the Global Warming Solutions Act, any carbon tax or any increased fuel taxes. I think it's regressive. It's going to hurt uh, the monitors uh, who are the most vulnerable financially. Uh, I would more rather focus on uh, chemicals that are causing cancer and municipalities dumping raw sewage into Lake Champlain. Thank you. Meg Hansen. Cl mild climate change has been demonstrated, but catastrophic climate change is speculated by computer models that have not been able to successfully predict anything. So these bills, you know, whether it's the carbon tax or the Transportation and Climate Initiative or the Global Warming Solutions Act or many others that come out of that, the, the underlying uh, premise is uh, climate alarmism and um, equating economic growth with pollution. Obviously, we want to limit pollution, but I think that understanding and exposing um, the underlying um, assumptions, wrong assumptions of these bills is very important um, moving forward. So no, I absolutely don't support it. And I don't think that economic growth and development is the same or synonymous with pollution. And Jim Hogue. This is a humongous problem and the, the world should be at, at war against um, the against climate change. And that can be done through paying the farmers to institute um, more efficient and uh, healthy farm methods. And I believe that that should, can be done by growing soil. And as I mentioned before, uh, flood mitigation, and that will reduce global warming tremendously. We could be a leader with that. Thank you, Jim. That's all the time we have for our questions today. So here's a closing question for all of you. What difference will it make to the people of Vermont if you're elected Lieutenant Governor? Dwayne Tucker? I, I wanna let the people of Vermont know that, uh, you know, if I'm elected Lieutenant Governor that I'll, I'll fight and, and uh, I, I, will, I will fight to open up the economic borders in Vermont to, uh, to, to erase the $4.6 billion deficit um, to to uh, increase revenue in the 13 counties of Vermont that uh, are, are not creating that are creating more more uh, of a deficit than than other other than Chittenden County obviously um, we we need to grow the grow state product in in the 13 counties of Vermont um, Vermont legislation lacks the uh, the the capacity to take advantage of the industry industry opportunities here in Vermont. Um, we, we really need to um, open up a lot of business revenue or opportunities for revenue. Thank you, Dwayne. Scott Mill. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, being in the travel business, I think we were 
early or maybe first to see the impacts of uh, coronavirus. I think we're going to be one of the last industries to come out of it. I'm sitting here in uh, my mom's office in downtown Barrie, Vermont, uh, office that's uh, been here for almost 45 years. Uh, we closed for a full day just this one branch. I buried my mom six years ago. Other than that, it's been open every business day since 1975 until mid-March of this year. It's been closed since then, along with every other branch of our company. The people that are working are working remotely. Our business is two or 3% of what it was uh, at this time last year. And I hear very, very similar stories from businesses all over Vermont. I'm gonna listen before I act, uh, but I'm gonna act boldly and strongly to help us help the governor and help the legislature and help Vermonters work our way out of the economic catastrophe that awaits us. It's gonna be as big or maybe bigger than the Great Depression. We've got a lot of work to do. Hope you uh, consider giving me a vote. I promise you I'll work hard to get things uh, going in the right direction. Thank you, Scott. Jim Ho. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. And uh, first thing is secede from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has a stranglehold on the economics of Vermont and a state bank and an infrastructure bank would be a step in the right direction from freeing ourselves up from them, just as North Dakota did in the early 1900s. Uh, another thing is I would look very carefully into the protocols for the current protocols for COVID-19 working toward opening up the state completely the way South Dakota did. Um, I would, th there's an, a huge issue here that even involves Front Porch Forum, which is free speech. Free speech seems to have been tossed in the dustbin in terms of what you're allowed to say on Front Porch Forum, on YouTube, and on, uh, on Facebook. And I, just from my own heart, I say, let's go back to the founding fathers who believed that an educated public is, is the way to make a democracy work. And as long as people are silenced, then we can't get these ideas out into the public. Thank you, Jim. Meg Hanson? As your next Lieutenant Governor, I will have the most robust an interactive constituent program service that Lieutenant Governor's, in Lieutenant Governor history. The, the reason is because I think it's very important for Vermonters to know what's happening in our government. We certainly have an accountability and transparency crisis. With my medical degree and health policy experience, I will be an advocate and an ally for Vermonters, especially middle-class families in Southern Vermont, the Northeast Kingdom, rural parts, um, where thousands of Vermonters feel that they're unheard and unrepresented in Montpelier. Uh, the importance of um, prioritizing work and expanding access to it is very important as we address the culture of despair and death that has consumed so many of our small towns. And uh, most of all, I will be a very bold advocate for um, your values and convictions that often have no place in our public discourse. Uh, standing up for values is not equal to shoving political talking points or agenda down anyone's throat. I think it's very important that we stand up for our values and convictions. And um, I will be your voice in that. Thank you. Dana Colson. As a native Vermonter, uh, and with a tremendous amount of business experience. I will support our constitution, our men and women in uniform, our farmers and small businesses. I will uh, fight to grow our economy and our GDP. I will fight for our tech schools and keep our colleges like Vermont Technical College Randolph Center open. And I will tackle the opioid crisis in order to save our kids. Uh, criminal justice reform will be a big part of that. Um, I hope that uh, we get a lot of support behind us. I'm part of a larger team of candidates to help make this happen. Uh, for more information and details, you can visit my website at www.colson4ltgov.com. Thank you, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Dana.
That's going to conclude the VPR Vermont PBS statewide primary debate. I'd like to thank our candidates today, Jim Hogue, Meg Hansen, Scott Milne, Dwayne Tucker, and Dana Colson. Thank you all very much for being part of the program. We appreciate it. Coming up on Thursday, we'll have a debate featuring the four Democratic candidates for Lieutenant Governor. So that's a program you won't want to miss either. I'm Bob Kinzel. Thanks for being with us today.